Good morning and welcome to the Fairfax County Government Center. And I'd also like to welcome all of our family, friends, and partners that are joining us live via Channel 16. My name is Barksdale Hagens, and I am with the Fairfax County Office of Human Rights and Equity Programs. And I'd like to welcome you to our Fair Housing Employment Practices Agencies of the Greater Washington Area's Human Rights Program. The theme of our program is the state of human rights in the DMV, legal updates and emerging frontiers. Let me get my glasses. Now for those of you here in our village that are more comfortable communicating in Spanish, we will have translation for you. Please know we are extremely excited to have each and every one of you join us for this information sharing and learning experience. I promise you this will be an enriching program. We have a lineup of speakers that are going to blow you away. We really brought in the heavy hitters this time. So you have a lot to look forward to. During our time together, we will be focusing on the subject and concept of human rights. The subject itself is not a novel concept in purpose or in application. Human rights is an inalienable fundamental right to which a person is inherently entitled. The doctrine of human rights in its purest application speaks to civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights and content. Whatever the theoretical or analytical justification, human rights refers to a wide continuum of values and principles promoted to enhance human agency and to protect human interest equally for all mankind. Now before we do a deep dive and I bring out our lineup of speakers, I want to acknowledge and welcome the Drainsville District Supervisor and the Fairfax County Chair of the Housing Committee, the Honorable John Faust. Mr. <laughs> Supervisor Faust, will you please stand and wave to the people? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, I'm extremely excited to introduce and actually hear from our first speaker. Our plenary speaker this morning is a young lady of national recognition and reputation. I've had the honor and pleasure of knowing Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Demetria McCain for many years. I can tell you from personal experience, Assistant Secretary McCain is a take charge person. And I mean that in the most positive and admirable way. I tell you, certainly, and, and those of you should, you know, understand this. Today in the times that we're living in, we really need someone like Ms. McCain to stand out as a leader and be a strong voice and speak to the challenging issues this country is facing. I know that she is the type of person that won't back down from opposition no matter how imposing or politically powerful these individuals and groups think they may be. I can tell you, those people on Capitol Hill, if they think that they're going to come up against her, they better come at her correct. Now, to corroborate my assessment, Ms. McCain is the primary driving force leading and guiding the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to address efforts and actions to eliminate housing discrimination, promote economic opportunity, as HUD focuses to achieve diverse, inclusive communities. Before joining HUD, Ms. McCain served as the North Texas Re served the North Texas region for 15 years at the Inclusive Communities Project. Some of you may know it as ICP during which time she served as president for five years. At ICP, she handled a multiplicity 
of functions and job assignments, some of which included the overall operations of the organization, communication, and ICP's mobility assistant program, which helped Housing Choice voucher holders exercise their fair housing rights. She also conceived and developed ICP's Voices for Opportunity, which was an initiative that provided advocacy training to low-income renters and neighborhood groups that served people of color. Prior to her time at ICP, Ms. McCain worked at the National Housing Law Project, also as an attorney for Neighborhood Legal Services Program in Washington, D.C., and she has also taught as an adjunct instructor on the subjects of fair housing and homelessness at Coppin State University, which is an HBCU. Ms. McCain is a proud graduate of the New York University and Brooklyn College, and she received her Juris Doctorate from Howard University School of Law. She's also a devoted member of the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporate. Will you all please join me in welcoming the Honorable Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Demetria McCain. Thank you so much, Mr. Dark Barksdale. That was very kind of you. Um, to assist some of those in the uh, person, in the in person and virtually, I am an African American woman with curly hair, medium length curly hair, heavy set, wearing a light blue dress. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Fairfax. <laughs> It's great to be here. Listen, I send greetings on behalf of our secretary, Marsha L. Fudge, who is the exact type of leader that we need during these very trying and challenging times. So welcome from her as well. Good to be here. It's good to be here. You know, as, 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 as a time when we are really kind of challenged with so much housing discrimination and, and an education discrimination, and I believe that Fairfax is no stranger to those types of issues. Am I right about that, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, I've, I've read about some of the work you all have done. I've read about your testing, fair housing testing you've been doing that really kind of revealed differences between housing providers' treatment of white and black testers, of white and Latinx testers, of white and Asian testers, of our deaf testers versus our hearing testers, especially in the lending and sales space. So I know that this fair housing organization is really doing the work so so I applaud you for that give yourselves a round of applause for that and let me tell you um, HUD's partnership with our, our fair housing assistance programs or FAPS as we call them are so critical we get a lot of calls about inquiries and complaints and I tell you out of all those calls and inquiries we get we are able to actually refer about 75% of them to our FAP partners like you all. So that's huge, hugely important to us. And, and let me just tell you that the cases that we deal with through our FAPS represent really, really, it shows the importance between having a federal and a local partnership, right? You local folks know what's going on on the ground. So that's just like really critical for us and it really helps us as, our, as we achieve our joint mission, right, of achieving a, a country where there is no housing discrimination. So, so that's really important to us. You have no idea how important to us. And whenever we hear that a FAP might be pulling out a program, we actually panic be honest with you. <laughs> so listen, we all know that, and maybe some of us don't, that this is actually the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, um, 55 years. So this has been like a really seminal law, law as it relates to civil rights. It's one of the last ones that people know about, right? We know about voting rights. We know about public accommodations. We know about employment. But the Fair Housing Act is one that's a little less less known to folks, but yet it's important that we recognize that it's been in place for 55 years. And out of those years, we have had some gains, absolutely. I mean, we've affected people's lives, millions of people's lives, right? And not only individuals' lives, we've affected neighborhoods. We've impacted neighborhoods with this Fair Housing Act, but 
But we've got to understand that even though our Fair Housing Act covers the seven protected classes of obviously race, right, national origin, color, religion, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, as well as familial status, we got to be honest with ourselves. There's a whole lot more that we need to do. A whole lot more, and I imagine you would agree with me on that. And so we've got to understand how much further we've got to go, not only to undo the systemic discrimination from the early 20th century that actually continues to plague us, right, but to address the perpetuating harms and honestly the new harms that are actually continuing to burden our country. It was on January 26, 2021, that President Biden penned a memorandum specifically to HUD, not to any other agency, specifically to HUD. And I want to lift up some of that language from that memorandum. Quote, diverse and inclusive communities strengthen our democracy, but our nation's history has been one of great struggle toward this ideal. During the 20th century, federal, state, and local governments systematically implemented racially discriminatory housing policies that continued to, seg continued to segregate neighborhoods and inhibited equal opportunity and the chance to build wealth for black, Latino, Asian American, and Pacific Islander, and Native American families, and other underserved, underserved communities. Ongoing legacies of, of residential segregation and discrimination remain ever present in our society. These include a racial gap in neighborhood ownership, a persistent undervaluation of properties owned by families of color, a disproportionate burden of pollution and exposure to the impacts of climate change in communities of color, and systemic barriers to safe, accessible, and affordable housing for people of color, immigrants, individuals with disabilities, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming and queer LGBTQ plus individuals. Close quote. So let me tell you folks, with all of that, with that directive directly to HUD, as well as all of our legal authorities, our office, FHEO, has been busy, okay? We've been a little busy. <laughs> so let me just say, the types of cases that our office handles, it ranges. And I know some folks here really focus more on employment versus fair housing, so I kind of want to break this down a little bit for you. So I will say that of the seven protected classes that we have under the Fair Housing Act, disability is the one that for which we see the most complaints, right? So if we look at fiscal year 2022, we received about 5,000 um, complaints under disability. Um, second to that is race with about 2,400. And then there is um, sex, like I said, including sexual orientation, gender identity, and retaliation, na national origin, and familial status. That, that follows those two heavier categories. Now, color and religion, they're the least reported, at least in fiscal 2022, and that's kind of the trend. And those types of complaints under color and religion often um, find other bases as well. But I think it's really important, and I always stress the concept of intersectionality, right? Because people fall under many of those protected classes. And for instance, one could um, be discriminated against based on disability and and color, disability, and national origin, right? And so that's important too. So sometimes people end up filing under both of those as well as retaliation, right? Retaliation meaning uh, they've been retaliated against because they have st stood up for their, for their fair housing rights. And so let me just give you an idea of the types of uh, discrimination that we hear about. Uh, one would include reasonable accommodation requests that go ignored by a property management company and owners causing people with disabilities to live inhumanely. And when I say inhumanely, I mean having to crawl up a flight of steps daily, even when there is a first floor unit available. Hard to believe, right? Those kind of cases we've had. A landlord denying rental to a young black woman, but not just that. <laughs> then placing discriminatory ads online then making discriminatory statements, and then retaliating against her. 
an owner discriminating based on sex while prohibiting the self-expression of a transgender tenant, telling her to dress like a man, talk like a man, act like a man. And I want to say it should be noted that this case was brought under the policy that was announced in the second month of the administration at HUD that would enforce the Fair Housing Act to bar discrimination because of sexual orientation and gender identity in a way that's consistent with Executive Order 13988 and the Supreme Court's ruling in the decision in Bostock versus Clayton County. And so while these are some of the reported cases that we've had, we all know in this room that many more discrimination cases occur, right, that don't get reported. For instance, while cases based, like I mentioned earlier, on religion fall in the lowest category of reported cases, if you've paid attention to the news at all, we see that the hate that is taking place around our country tells us that we still have people who are intolerant of others because of their religion. So that's why, that's why this very year, in coordination with the White House's uh, uh, federal interagency efforts to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, that's why our office actually issued a memorandum. And that memorandum is entitled, Ensuring Fair Housing Amidst Ongoing Religious Discrimination in the United States. Now, this memorandum that I wrote was provided to our fair housing staff, as well as our FIPS and as well as our FABs, simply reminding us, as the fair housing community that we are, to actually keep a watchful eye for housing discrimination based on religion. Now, people really know very often that they've been discriminated against, you know, but they're not always aware of what they can do about it, where they can go, and some actually don't even have hope that anything would ever be done about it. And so it's this administration, in particular our secretary, we have really been trying to hold lots of listening sessions from, from all corners of, of, of the country um, as it comes to stakeholders are concerned. Listening sessions so we can see what's happening to people with their lived experiences to inform the policies that we make so that we're not just making policies like in the abstract, right? And so this variety of folks include these types of groups. We've heard from black Section 8 housing choice voucher holders who've actually faced barriers when trying to move to low poverty, well-resourced areas outside of historically segregated areas. We've had listening sessions with the um, LGBTQ plus community, um, hearing about some of the challenges that young adults and youth face as barriers to housing, as well as those of that community who are aging, right? And then we've heard from folks like residents who are seeking accessible housing, who actually are demanding that their housing rights for reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications actually take place and are considered on the front end before the construction happens, right? So that we have more housing to accommodate these kind of folks. And then we've also heard from folks like those who have been just as involved, who are protected class members, who've actually returned home and despite having served their time, are unreasonably shut out of housing opportunities that would actually help them get on a more positive track. And so these are the kind of folks that we've been meeting with, talking about some of these issues. I told you about some of the types of cases, individual cases that we handle. But while, while, while HUD addresses these individual fair housing cases, let me say there's another part of the Fair Housing Act that is a little less known, okay? And that is the provision called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Mandate, right? So it's a tongue twister. I don't know what they were thinking when they wrote this. Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. We call it AFFH for short. Even that kind of gets caught on your tongue. But that piece, that mandate, was actually part of that 1968 Fair Housing Act, and not too many people know about it. And really, it really requires the administration to look at its HUD programs and all of its housing activities in a manner, and other agencies, in a manner that affirmatively furthers the policies of the Fair Housing Act. So what does that mean? It's more than just avoiding discrimination, right? We're all supposed to not discriminate. But AFFH requires a bit more. It requires us to take a look at the communities and to take a look and take proactive steps to really address some of the fair housing issues that currently exist. So 
back in um, February 2023, we actually published in the Federal Register a notice of proposed rulemaking, and that's entitled, guess what? A firm belief furthering fair housing. <laughs> and so the proposed rule, once we finalize it, it would implement the Fair Housing Act's statutory mandate to affirmably further fair housing, which requires the agency and its program participants, program participants, who are those folks? Those are our CDBG grantees, those are our public housing agencies, require all of us to proactively take meaningful actions to overcome patterns of segregation, to promote fair housing choice, to eliminate disparities and opportunities, and to foster inclusive communities that are free from discrimination. Now this particular proposed rule that we, that we published, it actually builds upon the planning framework that was established in 2015 through the 2015 AFFH rule with some notable refinements, I'll say. And so the public comment period closed in April. We received about 540 comments. We're going through all those comments. Uh, we asked questions to the public when we published that proposed rule. And so we're discussing that now, and we hope to have that out very, very soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, because there was an interim fi final rule published in 2021, um, age, uh, our program participants are able to voluntarily do some planning now. They don't have to wait for this proposed rule. And so our office is actually act, uh, providing technical assistance to those uh, CDBG grantees and those housing authorities who want to start the planning process now. And I, I want to note for folks, many don't know, very recently this spring, we put out on the HUD website a fair housing planning toolkit. And so people can take a look at that, that can get, help give them an idea of some of the things to consider when they're going about fair housing planning. And so that's, that's, that's taking place on the AFFH front. I'm a tr when you go home, go in the mirror and try to say AFFH really quickly three times. See how easy that is. <laughs> So also on the regulatory front, just this past spring, HUD published uh, a final rule, final, not proposed, but final rule, entitled Restoring HUD's Discriminatory Effects Standard, right? And so the final rule actually rescinds the department's 2020 rule governing the Fair Housing Act's disparate impact claims and restores that 2013 discriminatory effects rule. And so in this final rule that we published this spring, we've emphasized that the 2013 version of the rule is actually more consistent with how the Fair Housing Act has been applied in our courts and in front of the agency for well over 50 years, folks, okay? And so the discriminatory effects doctrine which includes disparate impact and the perpetuation of segregation, is actually a tool for addressing policies that unnecessarily cause systemic inequality in housing, regardless of whether they were adopted with a discriminatory intent, all right? And so it, this tool has long been used to challenge policies that unnecessarily exclude people from housing opportunities, including zoning requirements, lending and property insurance policies, and criminal records policies. So accordingly, having a workable discriminatory effect standard, it actually is vital to the Biden-Harris administration's goal of accomplishing creation of a housing market that is free from both intentional discrimination and free from discrimination of policies and practices that unjustifiably have a discriminatory effect, right? If we're talking effect and we're talking about intention, right? And I'll say one such example of a policy like this that often people lift up when they're talking about discriminatory impact is in the area of criminal records, right? Such as arrest. Now we all know that arrests are not proof of guilt, right? And black and brown persons face a disproportionate number of arrests. So when arrests are used as a barrier to rental housing, for instance, it has a disparate impact on those classes of people. And that's why in 2022, I actually issued a memo to our staff and to our fair housing partners reminding them of the general, our general counsel's 2016 guidance that they had issued. 
The name of the memo that I'm talking about is called Implementation of the Office of General Counsel's Guidance on the Application of the Fair Housing Act Standards to the Use of Criminal Records by Housing Providers and Real Estate Transactions. And that actual memo can be found on our website. And just to speak a little further about the specific type of barrier that I'm talking that I've just lifted up, as an agency, as all of HUD, not just FHEO, all of our other program offices, we come together and we're jointly looking at regulations to actually ensure that qualified people are not denied the opportunity to access HUD-supported housing solely due to their criminal records. So at the, at the direction of Secretary Fudge, HUD is actually working to propose changes to its own regulations governing public housing agencies and HUD subsidized uh, housing providers to actually prevent the unnecessary denials of housing assistance to people with criminal history records, okay? And so HUD also is planning on publishing a proposed rule that actually would remove the prohibition of preventing the hiring of people with criminal histories as fair housing testers. Right, because some of fair housing organizations are wanting to test for these types of things. So that's in the works as well. And so while the Fair Housing Act's affirmatively furthering provision actually requires proactive policy, there's also some other things that require proactive policies, including bridging the divide on the racial and ethnic home ownership gap, right? And so that's really big for our secretary. Secretary Fudge has placed a really high priority on improving home ownership opportunities. And special purpose credit programs actually have been of a particular focus. That's another one of those tongue twisters. I don't know why government has these hard words to say. Special purpose credit programs. So under this administration, HUD issued a legal opinion in December 2021 that makes it clear that special purpose credit programs which really, let me stop there for a second. These are lending programs that allow lenders to direct financial assistance to particular groups, such as those who have been historically locked out of home ownership, okay? And so um, there was guidance that was issued that, that stated that it's lawful under the Equal Credit and Opportunity Act in combination with its regulation B to have a special purpose program and that special purpose program actually does not violate the Fair Housing Act. And so we made that clear to lenders and other community members um, la December before last. And so with those legal concerns addressed, HUD actually has been encouraging lenders to seriously consider adopting these types of programs. And, and actually just la either last week or week before last, um, Secretary Fudge joined some of her peers from other um, agencies who have equities in this issue. Um, and they had a round table with industry folks, with advocates, stakeholders, and what have you, to try to see if they can further promote the use of this among the lending community. So that's a tongue twister too, special purpose credit programs, but that's something that, that is really big and could really try to address some of these issues when we talk about the home ownership gap. And really, it's not enough to just own a home. Fair valuation of a home also matters. Right, and maybe you've seen this in the paper a little bit. So today the median white family holds eight times the wealth of the typical black family and five times the wealth of the typical Latino family. On average, homes in majority black neighborhoods are valued at less than half of those in neighborhoods with few or no black residents. And so Secretary Fudge and, and the White House launched an interagency task force called the Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity Task Force, called PAVE for short, and which issued an action plan actually detailing how the administration will dismantle the racial bias in home lending and appraisal and promoting generational wealth, right? And so there is a bias when it comes to home appraisals. And so the task force has actually been helping cultivate an appraiser profession that really will have well-trained people who actually look like the communities around the country. Because at present, the appraisal uh, industry is, is about 90, 93% older white males. And that doesn't 
really track with what our country looks like much. And so the appraisal subcommittee has provided grant funds to places like the state of Mississippi to actually pilot a nine month appraisal training program. And they've actually graduated folks out of this. And so that's perhaps the type of model that might take off in other areas, we'll see. But for people to better understand this, I really recommend you going to YouTube and watching a documentary called Lowballed. Right? And there you'll see black homeowners who've had their homes appraised and they came out below what they expected. And then they recruited their white friends to come in, act like the homeowner. And next thing you know, the home is valued for sometimes hundreds of thousands more. You know, and so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about appraisal bias. And so we actually are taking those types of cases um, under our enforcement wing of FHEO. Um, so we have a number of appraisal uh, discrimination cases pending. Um, fortunately, FHFA actually has released some data um, regarding um, homes, and that's actually helped us with some of the work that we're trying to do to try to strengthen our way of investigating some of these cases. And so that's what's going on kind of on the uh, PAVE appraisal front around here. And then I will just say that there's a landmark um, outcome that we have that I'm really proud of that I just want to share and lift up here. There was a, a, a city where three local organizations brought an environmental justice issue to HUD's attention by filing it through our HUD complaint line. And so traditionally, fair housing tools have been overlooked as a way of addressing environmental issues. And actually, many don't know that HUD has the authority, not just, not, we don't have authority only under the Fair Housing Act, we have authority under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as well, as well as Section 109 of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. And so the Biden-Harris administration and Secretary Fudge are actually committed to addressing environmental inequality um, within the authority of our nation's laws, of course. And I just want to also point out for folks, if you want to check this out, there's an executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And so that's worth reading and checking out. And so in May, HUD actually negotiated a voluntary compliance agreement with the city of Chicago and with these three community-based organizations. And so the findings of noncompliance were issued by our office back in July 2022, and they actually arose from a complaint filed by these community groups, right, um, alleging that the city's actions and policies shifted polluting activities from, and this was a, a particular uh, uh, plant that we're talking about, factory, so to say, shifted the polluting activities from a predominantly white neighborhood to a predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhood where the city knew that the, the receiving community, the black and brown community, was already overburdened with environmental hazards. And so the negotiated uh, agreement aims to actually alleviate existing and preventing environmental burdens, such as pollutions and, and its negative health effects, and increases the opportunity for environmentally burdened communities to participate in the decision-making process. And so under this agreement, the city of Chicago will actually complete a comprehensive study of environmental burdens health concerns and social stressors across the city and actually use that study to inform and advance the reforms to land use permitting and environmental enforcement policies and procedures. And so under this agreement, the city will actually complete a comprehensive study um, and that, that hopefully will have some long-term effects, right? And so this has been a big deal, but I will say that this issue of environmental justice is a whole of government kind of thing. It's not just at the feet of HUD, um, but it's big. It's really big. And so it's really something that this administration is focusing on. And I just want to lift up this quickly. I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> Okay, we're good, great. So another uh, policy and enforcement update I want to give you guys, it's worth mentioning, it's related to the new enforcement authority that the Fair Housing, FHEO, Fair Housing Office is currently implementing, okay? Now, although FHEO has always been addressing Violence Against Women Act types of manners, matters, that we call it VAWA, lots of acronyms again, um, as part of the act's reauthorization in 2022, FHEO, our office, now has the authority to utilize an enforcement process that actually mirrors the Fair Housing Act's complaint process in an effort to assist 
survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So really, it should be known to everybody um, that domestic violence survivors should contact our fair housing complaint line to help protect their valid rights, right? And so FHGO has already conciliated a couple of these cases. We'll probably will be announcing that uh, in the coming days, I think. And so notably, I just want everybody in this audience to understand that under the reauthorized VAWA, applicants and tenants of certain HUD rental assistance programs may not be denied housing, may not be evicted, or have their housing assistance terminated because they have experienced domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, or sexual assault. It's really important to understand. And additionally, survivors must be able to access certain remedies, such as the ability to request an emergency transfer, right, for safety reasons related to the violence, which is, actually makes sense. So if a housing provider or if, if, if perhaps a survivor even is unclear about what the protections are, we actually have a VAWA website at HUD. I think it's hud.gov slash VAWA, V-A-W-A. And so I just wanted to point that out. There's uh, frequently asked questions on that site. There's housing protections. There's uh, some trainings on that site um, and other types of things relates to this. It's kind of somewhat new, so I just want to make sure people know where to go to find out more information. And so. Accessible housing. Accessible housing, as I mentioned, the biggest, the biggest sets of complaints we get are related to disability. So accessible housing continues to be a struggle for far too many, far too many in our country. And I want you to know that HUD actually is focusing on Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Because like I said, our authorities go beyond just the Fair Housing Act. Right, And so we call it the Rehab Act for short. So that particular act prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in any program or activity which receives federal funds from HUD. Right, And so actually this month, next week, the 26th, is actually the 50th anniversary of that particular act. And so just last week we had a presentation where we invited lots of folks who actually helped get that act adopted um, and there's a documentary, I think it'll be uh, on our YouTube site sometime soon. Our YouTube site is called HUD Channel on YouTube, if folks want to know. And so I, I, I would recommend checking that out where you can actually hear from the people who actually fought to get that act adopted. And so that recording should be on. And I would say, importantly, that um, HUD has not updated the regulations related to this act since 1988. They came out in 1988. It's been a minute. Some of who are older think 1980 was just the other year. For, it wasn't. Let's, let's be real. It wasn't. It was a while ago. So since that time, you know, the percentage of people who actually are living with disabilities has increased. And the older and older we get, we'll see more. And since that time, we know that technologies and construction and those kind of things have changed. And so that's something that we're really focusing on. So we actually published a proposed rule asking the public what they thought should be changed um, under those regulations. We received um, a number of public comments, and so we're going through those now. The public comment period closed very recently at the end of July. And so the purpose of that advance notice was to get the public comment from just a wide group of folks to give us an idea of what they wanted us to do. So I will say thank you for having me. That's kind of the, some of the stuff we've been up to. Um, and really thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, you know, fair housing is important. It's not something just nice to do. Fair housing is the law. So thank you for your partnership. Thanks for having me. Let's give another round of applause for PDSA Demetria McCain. Thank you so much. That information that you provided is so helpful. And I want to reemphasize the fact that a lot of the work that she has done since joining HUD, it really goes unnoticed. She's been an invaluable resource, not only to HUD, but to this country with a lot of the work that she's doing. So I, I want to personally thank you because I know. Team that helps me. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. She certainly unpacked a lot of information regarding fair housing and the law, 
And, and I want to add for those of you who joined us back in April during Fair Housing Month for the program that we aired, she, you know, she spoke to some of the same information, particularly the information on special purpose credit programs and providing access to people who may have spotty credit and may not be able to go to the typical lending institution to get a loan to buy a home. So I would encourage those of you who may have some deficiencies in your credit history or may have some issues to look into that program um, and contact HUD or contact us and we'll try to refer you to the proper resource. But you can go to a lending institution and ask them about you know, the program and how you can qualify if you have those types of issues. Just a moment. Well, at this time, we're going to give you the opportunity to stretch your legs, uh, take a, a break, quick five-minute break, and then we will return with the rest of our program. Again, we'll be taking a break for five minutes. Thank you. All right. If I may have your attention, welcome back, everyone. And I must say, that first half with our plenary speaker... Principal, Deputy Assistant Secretary Demetria Kane Boy, she, she unpacked a lot of information, a lot of great information. So again, I want to thank her for that. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you enjoyed and were inspired by our plenary speaker, you really have a lot to look forward to with our next guest speaker. We were fortunate after twisting some arms and using all of the leverage and sway that we had to get Ms. Mindy Weinstein to join us here today. Ms. Weinstein is the director over the DC field office for the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Ms. Weinstein is a valuable asset and the go-to person that many of us look to for providing guidance, direction regarding difficult issues related to employment discrimination. Ms. Weinstein, in the capacity of director, leads the office in overseeing investigations, mediations, federal sector hearings, and the office's outreach and education program in the District of Columbia and here in Northern Virginia. She has a rich history with the EEOC that includes serving as the EEOC's regional attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina, as a special assistant to former EEOC Chair Evan Kemp and later to former EEOC Vice Chair Leslie Silverman. She's also acted as an attorney in the EEOC Office, General Counsel's Systemic Litigation Program, and as a trial attorney in EEOC's Baltimore Office. She joined the EEOC after serving as a special assistant United States Attorney in Washington, D.C. She's a proud graduate of Wesley College and the George Washington University School of Law. So as you can see, she is bona fide. So please join me and let's give a strong welcome to Miss Wendy Weinstein. Good morning, everyone. I am bona fide. That's the first time I've been called bona fide. I don't know if <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, it's a little weird to talk with <laughs> these colleagues of mine behind me. Don't throw anything during the presentation, if you wouldn't mind. Um, but it's really an honor to be here and speak with all of you today. I am um, from the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, as uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, and the, specifically the Washington Field Office. And um, our prior speaker, Ms. McCain, talked a little bit about the 55th anniversary of the law that created them. So I'm going to give a plug about um, the history of EEOC real quick. Um, 
As I'm sure you all knew, for many reasons, including media attention, just last month was the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in Washington, D.C. And that was um, an occasion where 250,000 people came to the nation's capital to say enough. We would want to get legislation and other efforts to address discrimination in a wide variety of areas. And as a result, as largely as a result of that effort and so much more, including many decades of civil rights advocacy work, um, we, the Congress passed and President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that outlawed discrimination in a lot of different areas, one of which um, was employment. So Title VII of that big, momentous law, some call it the most significant law of the last century, created um, the EEOC and gave us the authority to enforce this amazing law, Title VII, um, that prohibits discrimination in employment based on race, color, national origin, religion, and sex. Um, it also bars retaliation. Over the years, we've gotten a number of different laws that we've become responsible for enforcing. Over the years, some of the laws have been interpreted in very significant ways by the Supreme Court. Sometimes the laws are amended, additional laws are passed, et cetera. One of the um, provisions, as I said, of that initial law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, covers discrimination based on sex. And over the years, there's been a lot of question, well, what, what exactly does that mean? And one of the earliest questions um, was whether it covers discrimination based on pregnancy. And the Supreme Court, in a case that isn't known as like the seminal most important case of the last century, said no. Um, pregnancy discrimination is not part of the law's um, sex discrimination provision. Subsequently, Congress passed an amendment to, the, to Title VII that said, yes, sex discrimination does include pregnancy discrimination. So for many decades, um, that has been the case. And by the way, in referring also to um, Ms. McCain's reference to the Supreme Court case, um, over the years, that's also been extended to include that sex discrimination covers sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. But I'm focusing today on pregnancy discrimination because I told you the first law that created the EOC and the first law that we were responsible for, and now I'm going to tell you about the last one, the most recent one that was just passed, which is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. And that has added additional dimensions to the coverage the protections against employment discrimination um, based on pregnancy. So I'm going to start with what is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and sort of what was it before and what is it now. So even before the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was covered, as I just indicated, um, sex discrimination was held to, was through legislation, um, was proclaimed to cover discrimination based on pregnancy. But um, that meant, among other things, um, that the, the, what the Pregnancy Discrimination Act said is that it covers discrimination against job applicants and employees based on pregnancy, childbirth, or other related medical conditions. Um, we, one of the additional laws that EEOC got authority to enforce once Congress passed it was the Americans with Disabilities Act. And while sometimes, if anyone here has ever been pregnant, you think, oh my gosh, this is kind of a disabling condition at various moments during the pregnancy, um, in fact, pregnancy itself is not considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But sometimes, a pregnancy um, exacerbates or causes a disabling condition which would be covered. So we basically had the possibility until a couple months ago that discrimination based on pregnancy could violate Title VII. It could be sex discrimination under Title VII, or it could, in some limited circumstances, if the person's situation arose to a disability, it could be employment discrimination based on disability. So these are a few examples. Um, not promoting people because they are pregnant would be sex discrimination under Title VII, firing workers because they're pregnant, same thing. Um, the uh, Supreme Court considered a case a few years back about, well, what about if you don't accommodate somebody who's pregnant, like who can't carry the trays and they're a weight 
wait staff person at a restaurant or um, otherwise needs some sort of accommodation during the period they're pregnant. And in a case against UPS, the Supreme Court said, well, that could be sex discrimination if there are somebody else that the employer is accommodating who's similar in their ability or inability to work. Um, so that kind of claim could be brought under Title VII. Um, harassment based on pregnancy, you know, all the fun really awful things that people might say to somebody. We see sometimes in these cases comments about a pregnant woman's body or um, other terrible things that are said. Um, that could constitute harassment and certainly is not fun or humorous. And um, finally, as mentioned, if the person had a disability, they could be covered for um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So let me tell you now about the new law, which is the focus of my talk. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was just passed at the um, end of December and became effective at the end of June. And what it says is that employers need to provide a reasonable accommodation to qualified workers with known limitations. Uh, obviously, this was written by lawyers, not you know normal people. Is a law that requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations to qualified workers with known limitations related to similar language to under Title VII, um, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, unless the accommodation would cause the employer an undue hardship. So I'm gonna unpack a little bit of that right now to give you a better idea um, of what the law means. But as I said, it, it just became effective June 27th, 19, uh, I mean 2023. Um, we have created a proposed rule to interpret that law. That's super important. We are in the comment period right now, and um, it is open for comments until October 10th. It, the proposed rule is, a lot of what's in the proposed rule is what I'm gonna talk about today, but um, it's just proposed. We are in the comment period. We're gonna consider all the comments. Please, if anything that I say today or anything that you find important, if you go to our website um, is of interest to you, please feel free to comment on that um, through the procedure that's, that's available there. Okay, so I mentioned it covers discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. Um, hopefully, you know, that is not the most um, difficult part of the statute. Th this language was used also in Title VII, um, and in the proposed rule that we have out there, we propose that it would mean the same thing that Title VII um, gives it meaning f for right now. Okay. The, um, it also says you have to be a qualified person who's affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, and of course it could be an applicant who's trying to get a job and is pregnant, maybe the employer. You know, we have cases sometimes where the um, initial screening and then maybe an initial interview is done on the phone and then a person comes in for this follow-up interview and they're like, oh, didn't know that. Didn't know you were, you know, very pregnant. So applicants are covered by this law, employees are covered by this law. Um, so you have to be qualified. What does that mean? You have to be able to do the essential functions, the fundamental duties of the job with or without an accommodation. Um, but you can also be considered qualified if you can, um, if your in inability to perform a an essential function is just for a temporary period of time, like the period that you are pregnant, um, if it could be performed in the near future, like when you are, after you've had the baby, um, and if that inability to perform the essential function can be reasonably accommodated. So we've talked about some sort of basic um, definitions, pregnancy, childbirth, related medical condition, qualified. So now let me give a few examples of the kinds of possible reasonable accommodations that might be um, considered. And of course, it's gonna depend on the individual person's pregnancy and on what the job is that they hold. So what one person needs may be very different. Although there might be some common ones like, and I am not pregnant, but the ability to drink water, um, <laughs> can be very important for a variety of reasons. And sometimes employers say you can't have water at your station, right? And so a person who's pregnant might need as an accommodation the ability to um, bring water, have a snack, take a break. They, they may need more frequent restroom breaks than they needed before. All of these are examples of the kinds of changes that um, we are talking about in the proposed rule that might be considered accommodations that an employer would need to provide. Um, and all accommodations, whatever the situation is, going back to the initial slide, 
An employer doesn't have to provide an accommodation if it would cause an undue hardship. But they should consider a variety of accommodations, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, it could be involve accommodating by changing a uniform. You know, maybe the restaurant or the um, uh, um, like medical setting or um, the security job has a uniform and says everybody has to wear this and now the person's pregnant. Maybe th this might be the first female this, um, who's ever held this job. Well, that person may need a different uniform. So that's another example of the kind of accommodations um, that might need to be considered. Safety equipment, that's another one. A change in a work schedule, um, a temporary reassignment, leave for medical appointments. Sometimes people start a new job and then, you know, shortly they're pregnant and maybe the um, employer's leave um, availability hasn't kicked in yet. But under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, they may be entitled to leave for medical appointments. You know, some people need an appointment every week or every other week, especially near the end of a pregnancy. That might be an accommodation to be considered under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Um, so what, what does it mean to request an accommodation? Well, there isn't an exact um, procedure or form or anything like that that needs to be filled out. You know, normal human interaction can work here. Hi, boss, I'm pregnant, and um, as a result, I need to go to doctor's appointments. My doctor says I need to come in every other Friday. My doctor says I can't um, hold, you know, carry those heavy boxes anymore. I'm going to need some time off um, as a result of childbirth. Any of the, those kinds of words can be communicated orally, verbally, by somebody else on your behalf. Um, but basically, the gist of it is that you're indicating that you have some sort of limitation um, related to, affected by, or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition, and that you need some sort of an adjustment. That's, that's what's involved in requesting an accommodation. Then there's supposed to be um, an interactive process that follows that, where the employer, maybe it's HR, maybe it's the supervisor or a manager, and the employee um, or the applicant who um, needs some sort of accommodation has, a, in essence, a dialogue, a conversation, um, some sort of interaction where you try to assess like what would work here, what's going on, what's the need, what, what, what might work. Um, okay, so the, the broad, the biggest provision, I would say, in many ways of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is the requirement that employers um, not fail to accommodate somebody who is qualified um, and has one of these um, needs based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition. But I just want to mention there are a few other provisions of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act that are also important, and, and I, I just wanted to highlight them here. So um, in addition to not um, accommodating somebody, you also can't force an accommodation on someone. Like somebody says, I'm pregnant, just want you to know I'm really excited, I'm you know, due in March. And the employer can't then say, OK, well, I'm going to pull you out of your job because I just think it's too strenuous. Or I'm going to put you on leave the last two months because I just think you should take that time and you know, decorate the nursery or whatever. You know, I mean, an employer can't impose an accommodation that they think is best, even if it is you know, in some way um, from a kind perspective, and, um, and you can't be forced to accept an accommodation like that. There's supposed to be an interactive process. Um, you also can't deny an employment opportunity to a qualified employee or applicant because you think you will have to provide a reasonable accommodation in the future. So that would include my situation where the, you know, you have the phone interview and then you show up and you're visibly pregnant and the employer's like, okay, we're no longer interested or they withdraw the job on your first day um, because they think, well, I'm probably going to need to accommodate this person. I don't want to bother with that. Um, you also, um, an employer also can't require someone to take leave when there are other accommodations that are available that would meet the need and would not be an undue hardship. Again, that standard is undue hardship. Um, leave sometimes is what is best and what the employee wants, but sometimes the employee actually wants to work and um, needs to work. And so an employer can't just say, you know what, we're not going to um, remove that function or make some change. If they can do it, they should do it and not just force the person to take leave instead. 
Okay, it is um, also illegal under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act to take an adverse action like firing someone or not hiring them, um, interfering with their rights. You can't retaliate against somebody because they made a request for an accommodation. You know, just because you come in and say, hey, I'm pregnant and I'm gonna need some you know, time off for medical appointments and then the employer can't retaliate against you because you did that because you filed a charge, because you filed a complaint with the HR people. Um, you also, the employer also can't take that action not only against the person who is pregnant or um, has just given birth or has a pregnancy, other pregnancy related condition, but if somebody else says to the boss, hey, you know, that's not fair. I think we should accommodate that person or, you know, I'm willing to help her out or, you know, some other um, activity where they request an accommodation for someone or oppose what they think is discrimination against that person, then a retaliation against that coworker would also be illegal. Okay, um, I'm gonna just mention briefly um, what, in, what a person can do if they believe that they have been discriminated against. And um, obviously there are options within an organization, talking to HR, et cetera, but um, people can file discrimination charges with the EEOC or with these kind folks sitting behind me. Um, at the um, state or local level in, in many jurisdictions, including where we are, there are um, there's the ability to file a local charge of discrimination as well. So there are time limits for doing that, and it's normally, for, for the most part in our area, for EEOC, it's 300 days from the date of discrimination, but that's only against employers that are also covered by one of our friends um, on the state or local level. Otherwise, it's normally 180 days. There's a lot of information on the EEOC's website about how to file a charge and how that process begins. We, we normally begin with an online portal and people can enter their information and um, schedule an intake interview and that's how it normally uh, begins. But there are other ways to gain access as well, and like I said, there are opportunities on the local level, so you can reach out to the local agency in your community as well. Um, I should also mention that our law applies to employers that have at least 15 employees. You'll probably hear a little from my colleagues um, behind me in a minute about their laws and who they apply to. For us, it's 15 or more employees. Our law applies to state and local governments, unions, staffing agencies, all the rest. Our law also applies to federal workers. So if you work for a federal agency, the same normal EEO rules going to an EEO counselor within 45 days is how that process would begin. Um, if a charge is successful, um, then these are some examples of the kinds of relief one might get under our EEOC laws. You might get the accommodation needed. Sometimes, um, you know, there's other opportunities for non-monetary relief like training for the people involved. Um, many times our settlements include, you know, the manager has to go to some sort of training to understand what the rules are about discrimination because we're very focused not only on providing relief to the individual harmed but also to um, prevent future discrimination. So there might be accommodations, training, policy changes, other kinds of non-monetary relief, and there may be um, a, a relief in terms of wages, lost pay if a person was fired. When the employer found out they're pregnant, then maybe they would get the back pay for the period they were unemployed. Um, and compensatory and punitive damages are also available. We see compensatory damages in a lot of our cases under all of the statutes that we enforce. So um, depending on, you know, if the person suffered emotional harm, if they had additional damages as a result of the discrimination that they experienced. Okay, can you give me a sense of how much time I have? Okay, so I have a few fact patterns, but I wanna take a moment to see if anybody has a question before I discuss that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the question is, does, it does this law apply to um, women who want um, an accommodation to allow them to breastfeed at work? We're not to, pump to pump, yes. Okay, so yes, it could very well apply to that. Um, 
This is a perfect example of where you might want to go to our website and get information about making comments on the rule. Um, you know, all of these questions about what is covered and what, what is an accommodation, um, are, you know, we are seeking public input on. But I just want to mention, on the same day in December of last year that President Biden signed the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, he also signed something that's referred to as the PUMP Act. And the PUMP Act is, re, is um, enforced by the Department of Labor. It's another federal law, and it provides specific um, requirements in terms of making uh, clean space and break time available for people to pump at work. So that's another provision that is important in response to that question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So I, I think the question is, um, like, if there's a single mother and there's an adult child who um, would be taking care of the newborn baby, is that what, what you're saying? Would, it, would this apply to that? Yeah. Um, so again, I encourage everyone strongly to look at the proposed rule. Um, I'm like a commercial for our proposed rule. Um, but th these are important questions that I think um, you know, you, you are more than encouraged to go look at and, and um, ask questions about or make recommendations about. The law basically applies um, under the way it's written or under our proposed rule to the worker um, and not to their spouse or other people in their lives, but how it should be interpreted. Again, we're in the midst of figuring that out, so feel free to file a comment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the question is about: um, Does the law apply to the 40 weeks of a typical pregnancy or some other period beyond that? So um, the law applies to pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. So it certainly applies to the 40 weeks or however long the pregnancy is. It applies to the childbirth. So um, again, all of this is being worked out through the proposed rule um, and related medical conditions. So if there's a condition that's related to pregnancy or the childbirth, which could be before or after, again, we're working through these issues now, then this law potentially could be involved in all of that. So. Yeah, I, I can't, we don't have a rule yet. The PUMP Act that I mentioned applies for one year after childbirth. Yeah. Anybody else have a quick question? Okay. I'm going to um, just run through real quick a few fact patterns. The first one is a pregnant cashier asks if her supervisor um, will let her sit while working at the register. Um, because standing all day makes it, um, it's very difficult for her to do that while she's pregnant. Cashiers normally have to stand here. So again, we have a known limitation. She's pregnant. She, she's um, unable to stand the whole day. She's qualified. She can do the cashier job, and she could do it if she didn't have to stand all day. And so the question is, is it an undue hardship? Most of these cases, and you know, this law has just become effective, you know, three months ago, less. Um, so it's not like we have a ton of cases on this. But we do have related cases under the Americans with Disabilities Act and under the Title VII provisions I discussed earlier. So um, typically in cases like this, I think a stool is sort of an obvious answer. Um, so in most cases, a stool would allow you to be able to, to do the job. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about in our proposed rule. and. Um, probably it would not be an undue hardship. The second fact pattern, a pregnant delivery driver asks for light duty because they can't lift heavy boxes because of their pregnancy. The employer has a light duty program for people who are injured on the job um, that excuses them from lifting heavy packages. Here too, known limitation, difficulty with um, lifting heavy boxes, qualified for the job, able to do it. Um, and then the question is, can there be an accommodation that would not cause an undue hardship to the employer? So we would look at things like, you know, what do they do in other situations where a person has a broken arm? Or, you know, can other people cover that? Can this person 
who's pregnant and has this limitation do something else during the time they would normally be lifting the boxes in the, you know, the first hour of their employment. These are the kinds of questions that we're looking at. Is there some way to accommodate that? Could that function be removed, um, given to others? Is there some way to move the boxes without this person having to lift them? You know, some sort of machine, cart, et cetera, that would allow the, the work to get done. And then whether any of this would cause an undue hardship. And my last example is um, a call center employee needs time off to attend therapy for postpartum depression. The employee has not earned enough sick leave to cover the time they need for the therapy appointments. So again, um, this, so this is not um, during the 40 weeks of pregnancy, to go back to that question. This is after the pregnancy. Um, the person has postpartum depression. They have a uh, limitation in the sense that they need time off, which they don't currently have available to them under the normal leave policy. They're qualified to do the job, and the question would come down to, is it an undue hardship to allow them to take this time off? Um, so these are the kinds of questions, as I mentioned before, many, many times, our proposed rule is open for public comment. Um, I encourage everybody who's interested to check that out, file comments. Um, we're very excited. We've come a long way since our, uh, the initial law that created us um, to have this law that provides these additional protections for pregnant workers. Um, and we're excited to be enforcing it. And again, thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I, I appreciate the questions and the attention. Thank you very much. Now, wait a minute, Ms. Wines. When you come back up here, don't you go anywhere. Because I certainly want to build upon what I said. I know you questioned about me referring to you as a Is she not a bona fide rock star when it comes to employment and employment discrimination? All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh -huh. She certainly gave us some valuable information, particularly as it pertained to pregnant, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Now, moving forward, I want to turn our attention now to a special segment of our program. We were fortunate to pull together some of the leading experts in the field of human rights to join us and share their thoughts today. Now bear in mind, these are giants who lead the local offices here throughout Northern Virginia in addressing civil rights issues and enforcing various human rights ordinances and federal laws. Let me tell you, the Avengers don't have a thing on these heroes and sheroes we have here today with us. So allow me the pleasure of introducing that panel. I'm not going to go through their bio information. You have the program booklet, so I will refer you to um, go there to read up on their history. I'm doing so in the interest of time. So first up on the list, Ms. Jean Kelleher. She is the deputy city manager for the city of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Next to her, Mr. Kenneth Saunders, the director of the Office of Human Rights and Equity Programs for Fairfax County. Mr. Raul Torres, the executive director for the Human Rights Commission for Prince William County. Ms. Melinda Nebel, fair housing coordinator for the Loudoun County Department of Housing and Community Development. And last but not least, Ms. Susan McClanahan, the Senior Manager of Fair Housing Rights Programs for the Equal Rights Center. Now, before we move forward, I do want to apologize. Your, the current program book that you, that you have does not identify or have the information for Ms. Nebel in that. It, unfortunately went to print before we could get all the information for her. We're in the process of revising and updating it with her information. So by next week, we hope to have that uploaded on our website with Ms. Nebel's information as well. So again, I certainly apologize to you. It certainly wasn't intentional. Um, but we're certainly glad and pleased to have you here in person. So that's the main thing. Each of the panelists will share some interesting and critical information about their agencies and the services that their respective, their respective offices provide. So first, I've been given a, a direct order that I need to recognize <laughs> and allow my boss to speak first. So 
I know how to follow orders and I want to keep my job. <laughs> so first up on the list, we will have Mr. Kenneth Saunders share some information with us. Thank you, and I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, this segment is really just to give you a brief overview of the services of our office. I think there may be different things um, that we do a little bit different, but just to give you an overview. Now, the mission of the Office of Human Rights and Equity Programs is to ensure equal opportunity to promote justice, diversity, and inclusiveness by protecting the civil rights of people living and working in Fairfax County. If you feel, if you feel that you've been faced with unlawful discrimination in housing, employment, private education, credit, or public accommodation, help is available to you through our office. We receive and investigate complaints from individual citizens alleging discrimination based on federal protected classes, including race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes sexual harassment, gender identity, and sexual orientation, and disability, as well as age, childbirth and pregnancy, genetic information, familial status and housing, military status, source of funds, and retaliation for complaining of any of the above mentioned protected classes. When we are unable to, forward on, to move forward on a complaint because either the subject matter is not covered by law or the complaint is not based on one of the protected classes under the ordinance, we still make every effort to connect people with resources that are helpful through their particular case whether that be a federal agency or another county agency, or in some instances where there are jurisdictional issues, a different human rights office. People don't need an attorney to file a complaint or at any point during our investigation, and there is no fee for filing a complaint of discrimination with our office. Also, we do not inquire into anyone's citizen status. There are several ways to initiate a filing of a complaint with our office. First, you may complete an online questionnaire located on our website. You do not have to come into the office, and a staff member will contact you to schedule an intake appointment to review your complaint. Now, you can either come into the office or you can do that virtually. What I have found is that some individuals actually want to come into the office but with COVID, we've moved to more of a convenience for most individuals where we can send you a link. You can contact our office by phone to schedule an intake appointment or visit our office. We're located here in the Government Center and our normal walk-in hours are Wednesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. However, those are our normal walk-in offices. Typically, we will have someone in the office. If it's an urgent matter, we'll have someone that can take your intake at that time. If a complaint meets jurisdictional and subject matter requirements, our office will draft a complaint of discrimination for the complaining party to sign and we will begin an investigation into the complaint. During the investigation process, an investigator will collect documentation and evidence conduct interviews, and summarize all of the evidence collected. The time it takes to investigate a complaint can vary depending on a variety of factors. When the investigation is complete, a final report is issued outlining whether or not the office determined there was sufficient evidence for a finding of discrimination. If the evidence supports the claim made, you in some instances receive relief to remedy the discrimination conduct that you were subject to, including but not limited to back pay, reinstatement, approval of rent on apartment, and reimbursement of fees assessed in housing. Acts of discrimination compromise million, millions of lives daily. No one should have to face injustice of any form. If it happens to you, our office is here to help. More information as well as a variety of resources in multiple languages are available on our resource, on our website. So um, I know you made that comment and my colleague to the right insisted that she go second. <laughs>
I'm going to allow Commissioner Flores to close out the presentation. So next up, we will allow Ms. Kelleher to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barksdale, and welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate this collaboration so much, and um, I respect my colleagues. We work very closely together, um, and it's a treat to get together um, whenever we can. I, I loved listening to Mindy Weinstein's presentation because when I was pregnant with my oldest child, who I know it's hard to believe, but is now 40, um, I applied to a law firm. I had just finished law school, and um, I was fired. I was an applicant who disclosed pregnancy and was fired. And I, fi I filed a complaint, actually, with the Fairfax office at that time, which was way behind where you are now, Ken. Um, and ultimately, the, the bottom line was that it was a justifiable business decision. So that tells you how far we have come. And believe me, our local offices take this kind of complaint, as well as all of the other areas that, that we enforce, very seriously. And we are so pleased that we have our, the relationship with the Washington Field Office of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission because it's just a great collaboration. And for cases for which we have concurrent federal and local jurisdiction, our complainants receive excellent, excellent attention. Our processes in the city of Alexandria are very similar to what Ken has said is happening in Fairfax. And I should mention that sometimes for some of you whose address is Alexandria, it's confusing because it may be a city of Alexandria address, or it may be an Alexandria address within Fairfax County. So certainly call one of our offices, and we'll make sure that we get you to the right place. In Alexandria, we will investigate an allegation of discrimination of any kind that occurs within the city limits. And in addition to our specific ordinance, we believe that our enforcement authority dates back to the original city charter. But the Alexandria Office of Human Rights and the Human Rights Commission were created in 1975. The ordinance was among the most broad at that time, not just in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but in the nation. And we have tried to keep up over the years with adding protected categories. Uh, we have uh, most of the same categories that Ken has articulated and are planning to add source of income this year with respect to housing. In addition to our enforcement authority, uh, we work very closely with our Human Rights Commission on systemic issues, keeping an eye on conditions in the city that might give rise to unlawful discrimination. The commission does not have uh, a authority over our cases in the sense that there is no direct right of appeal from my office to the commission, and that's different from the offices of, of my colleagues. We also, uh, in, in the employment arena, do cover cases that where there are fewer than 15 employees, which is the, the threshold for federal cases. Um, but we were just chatting up here and saying that we will often file a case and assert federal jurisdiction and put the burden on the respondent company to prove that they don't have that many employees. At any rate, we can handle the matter if there are more than four in the city of Alexandria. And for most of our state protections, um, one must have more than five employees. But again, we cover more than employment. We do housing, public accommodations, city contracts, credit, education, health and, and social services. So we encourage all of you to contact our local offices, tell your story. We have time to listen. We have excellent investigators who will meet with you. And we do have many different ways that you can, can reach us by phone, walk in through our website, or virtually, certainly, as, as we progress through your story and do your intake. And I just want to mention that our local offices, not just mine, but we, we serve in really important roles in our community. My day job, I, although I'm an interim uh, deputy city manager at the moment, 
my day job and my, my love is human rights. I'm the director of the Human Rights Office. And, and that's where my primary focus is. I work closely on strategic initiatives in the city, whether it's an equity initiative or the Community Remembrance Project, which is part of the Equal Justice Initiative, honoring uh, those who were lynched in the 1890s. We work closely on police issues, and, and really the Human Rights Commission served as a, a citizen review board before there were the state laws creating those community policing review boards. I always say that if we have safe communities, it's not just police and fire. It's what we do. It's the information we provide, the resources we leverage for you. And we are here to help you. And um, I always tell the elected officials, it's what we do in human rights and what the Human Rights Commission does that's important to help keep our communities safe. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Next, we will turn our attention and allow comments from Ms. Melinda Neville. Hey. So it's an honor to be here representing Loudoun County's Department of Housing and Community Development. I'll focus more specifically on fair housing and the work that we're doing in Loudoun County to ensure equal access and opportunity to everyone. We are, our board recently passed the Fair Housing's Regional Analysis of Impediments, and we are currently working on creating an action plan and have already started that process by hiring a fair housing coordinator, me, to oversee the process of influ or in integrating fair housing into all of our programs and processes. We work very closely with the Office of Equity and Inclusion to ensure that we are increasing access for limited equity or limited English proficiency communities and to increase accessibility in all of our programs. We unfortunately do not have the capacity to investigate and delineate in fair housing complaints, so we work closely with the Virginia Fair Housing Office and our other partners at ERC and Virginia Home to ensure that those complaints are thoroughly investigated. We are working to create more outreach and education opportunities to ensure that every resident of Loudoun County knows their rights and knows where they can report if they feel like they have had their rights violated. We are also working on continuing to create more programs that ensure that everyone has access to fair and inclusive communities. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, and I want to emphasize Ms. Nebel and her team, they're doing excellent work there in Loudoun County to address issues of housing discrimination. Thank you so much. Next up is Ms. Susan McClanahan. Is this on? Yes, great, sorry. Don't know how microphones work. My name's Susie, I work at the Equal Rights Center. We are a civil rights organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., uh, but we serve Northern Virginia as well. And we seek to identify and eliminate discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations in the metropolitan region, as well as nationwide. And one of the primary ways that we seek to identify discrimination is through what's called civil rights testing. Civil rights testing involves, for instance, using two individuals who have who are assigned very similar characteristics except for one variable. So for instance, if we're doing race testing, we might send a white tester and a black tester to an apartment complex and see whether they're given the same information, whether they're told both about the same units, the same rental rates, the same specials. And through that, we can objectively see what is going on in our local housing market, um, assist individuals who are experiencing discrimination, and also file complaints on our own behalf to try to address discriminatory practices that we encounter. Additionally, in the Washington, D.C. region, including Northern Virginia, the District of Columbia, the State of Maryland, and Jefferson County, West Virginia, we provide free assistance to individuals who are alleging housing discrimination. So that can look like many things. For instance, we will do direct advocacy with the landlord. Uh, we get a lot of complaints, for instance, from voucher holders at properties not taking vouchers or misapplying minimum income requirements, and we can advocate on their behalf so that they're able to actually access that housing. 
We also help folks with disabilities submit requests for reasonable accommodations or reasonable modifications in housing, and we'll go through the whole process with them to ensure that those requests are properly approved. This can be for things like emotional support animals, an accessible parking space, a transfer to a more accessible unit, things like that. We also assist folks with filing complaints at the Fairfax County Office of Human Rights and Equity Programs, the Virginia Fair Housing Office, as well as HUD, and we will go through the complaint process with them. Um, finally, we also will do civil rights testing based on intakes we receive, in addition to us doing what we call systemic testing, um, in order to better understand what's going on and try to substantiate an individual's complaint. Uh, finally, we also provide services to housing providers so that they are aware of best practices and better understand their fair housing obligations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. McClanahan. And we have certainly benefited here in Fairfax County from partnering with the Equal Rights Center and the work that they're doing. So thank you again. Last but not least, I want to recognize and turn your attention now to Mr. Raul Torres. Uh, good morning, still. Uh, the mission of the uh, Prince William Human Rights Commission is similar to the mission of all other uh, anti-discrimination organizations, be it nonprofit, be it local government, be it federal government, uh, uh, which is to eliminate discrimination uh, within specific areas and uh, to prevent discrimination through outreach and education. So those are the main things that local or federal uh, laws uh, would or organizations would do. Uh, in the world of human rights, we, we talk about protected classes and protected activities. And for you to have a valid complaint of discrimination that you can file any or in any of our organizations, uh, you would have to be a member of a protected group and you would have to be engaged in one of our protected activities. For Prince William, the protected activities are employment, housing, credit facilities, education, and public accommodations. So if you're a member of a protected class, engage in one of those activities, of any of those activities, you may have a valid uh, complaint to start with. And the protected classes are the traditional ones, you know, like race, color, sex, national origin, age. Uh, we have specifically uh, uh, written in our ordinance sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, disability, familial and marital status, uh, source of income, and uh, status as a veteran or military status. Uh, those are the protected classes that we cover. There may be slight differences between our local ordinances in terms of if there's one or another that, that might be or not covered uh, as, this, as of this time. Uh, and also some may have more protected activities and some may have perhaps less protected activities. We also do fair housing testing, and we recommend fair housing testing to every organization, regardless if it is a local human rights a, a organization or an organization that only has a housing department and not a local, uh, house, a local uh, human rights uh, ordinance. The reason being because fair housing testing serves <clears throat> two purposes. The first purpose is to try to catch any non-compliance with fair housing laws, and the second one is that it actually keeps landlords focused on compliance uh, because they know they will be tested. So they pay attention to compliance for fair housing laws rather than being a little lax in terms of fair housing training for their own rental agents. So even if you don't have a local human rights ordinance but you do have a housing department, you may engage in fair housing testing under your fair housing you know, mandates uh, on HUD, and we do recommend that you do that. Uh, so that's part. In our office, like in any of my colleagues' offices, you can access it very easily. You can go personally walk in. You, you, you can call in a phone. You can go to our website. You can do any kinds of things. If you speak another language, you can just call, 
we will make arrangements for an appointment where an interpreter would be a, 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 a for you at that appointment. So, so we try to make intake as easy as possible for anybody, regarding your level of education or your, or your status uh, or where you live. We're located in Route 1, the part that, that touches Prince William County, uh, which always starts in, in Alexandra in Northern Virginia and go all the way uh, south. And uh, we are located in a place that has a, a bus stop that right in front of, of the building. So, so it has very accessible ways of doing it. Like any other human rights commission, we are territorial. We have territorial jurisdiction. Uh, if something happens to you in Prince William County, within the jurisdiction of Prince William County, we, we can uh, attend to it. You may be a resident of Prince William County and have something happen to you somewhere else. We don't have jurisdiction over, over that particular. It's the place where the adverse action occurs, or the alleged discriminatory act occurs. You may be from Maryland and just happen to be in a public accommodation in Prince William County. We have jurisdiction over that. We are perhaps the one that have the longest time for you to file your complaint. There are some jurisdictions that have 300 days, others have 180 days. We have 365 days. So even you may lose jurisdiction in, in the EOC, and we still have jurisdiction over your case if it happened in Prince William County. So, so we have that extra 65 days, put it that way, to cover acts of discrimination that may not be timely on other jurisdictions. Uh, we have a demographics of about uh, half a million people in Prince William County. So we serve a big community with little resources. We have two investigators, one outreach, uh, education person, and, uh, and two managers. So uh, with that, we have to serve half a million people. We have to outreach the, the most of half a million people and work with that. But like, if you aggregate what all our jurisdictions do, we play a very important role, um, have played a very important role for the community for a long time. Prince William County Human Rights Commission have been opened its doors in 1993. And most of the commissions have been in that area of the 90s, early 90s, serving these communities. So again, this is one of the most important things that, that we have <clears throat> in our local communities to help people. And all people, not only people of color, okay? Because there's a lot of white people that may feel discriminated based on age, based on sex, and, and, and don't necessarily encourage the belief that human rights laws are only for people of color. They're not. They're for every human being. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Torres. At this time, we're going to allow you to ask, uh, how many questions can we take? About three? About three questions. Now, if you have a question, we'll have someone come to you with a mic so we can make sure that everyone hears, particularly those who will be responding. Any questions from the audience? OK, the question is regarding localities' ability to increase capacity, funding, and resources for you to be successful to continue the fine work that you're doing, any one of you. Three of them. Um, I would say, as most advocacy groups for matters that they're interested in, contact your, um, your elected officials. Uh, if you see that you think you need more housing enforcement or more enforcement with respect to uh, employment matters, um, that's how people get heard. You need to contact your elected officials. Anyone else like to speak to that? I would agree with that, and I think that because most of us establish great relationships with our community-based organizations and nonprofits, you know, we have an open dialogue and we have an understanding of what the needs might be. Uh, I will also say, in the city of Alexandria, 
we have a statute that provides for, for our investigations to be completed within 180 days. That means we need adequate resources to be able to do that. That's written in the law. And so over the years, if, if, uh, if I didn't have enough investigators to be able to do that, then I would put that in the budget proposal for the, for the next fiscal year. I echo what, what she said. And uh, there's public comments in every you know, uh, opportunity in every locality that people actually come and say how important you feel that human rights are, what are the, the things that you think that that human rights should be capable of doing or, or the resources that, that should be given. So that's one. Second, your own supervisor from your own district that you may have a relationship with. And uh, we don't have the 180 days uh, limit for investigations. We have a two-year limit on investigations. And, uh, and certainly, you know, we don't take two years to do an investigation, but we, we do take close to a year to investigate a case. And sort of to dovetail with what um, each of them have shared, it, it is important for you to be involved in the process, the, the civic process. So during that budget cycle, when they have an opportunity for you as citizens and residents to come and speak, come and share your thoughts, share the needs that you have in your community. community. And, and I want to tell you, there are strength in numbers. So if you can come and bring some people with you, that's, that's going to send a message as opposed to you just coming down by yourself. Now, I'm not discouraging. If, if, only, if you're the only one that can come down and be that voice for your community, then fine. I encourage you to do so. But get your neighbors to come. You know, get relatives to come. There are strength in numbers. So come down and let your voices be heard. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Wait one minute. Let me get a can uh, I can only speak for Fairfax County. We've been testing ongoing probably since 2017. So it's a, um, it's an inward look. Um, it's a critical look at what is going on in your community. But I think the, the Board of Supervisors and, and, and the county government feel that it is that important. So um, it's part of what we do with the enforcement. But the testing shines a light. I agree. It serves two purposes. It keeps people on their toes and it lets you know what's going on in your community so that you can fine tune both your enforcement and your community outreach and education. Mm -hmm. okay. We have another question here. Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes, sir. So, uh, my wife works for the discrimination. I think his comment spoke to the fact that there is a need for more information to be available throughout the community at various resource centers, uh, schools, even religious organizations about the services that our organizations and our agencies provide. Any of you want to speak to this as well? Yeah, just briefly, um, we do quite a few um, outreach events over here. In fact, we have one coming up. This is an outreach event. We have one coming up this weekend. What I say for the community-based organizations, if you contact us, we'll come. Um, with the advent of the virtual meetings, it's, it's much easier, but we have one this weekend. Um, so if, if you have a community-based organization that this is the issue that you want to address or get more education out there, feel free to give us a call. And, and if I may say, Barksdale, I think that the pandemic taught us a lot. Uh, we were working in the city of Alexandria closely with the health department on getting the word out initially on the spread of the disease and then later on immunizations and all of that. But we went to typically underserved communities, and they said, stop sending us flyers in our languages. Just come talk to us. Like, if there's a food distribution, come with a bullhorn and tell us what you're going to do. Um, so we learned, which is intuitive, that we should go where people are. And so we, even with limited resources, my Human Rights Commission has decided to go to food distribution centers and bring our information and actually chat with people. So we do that on Saturday mornings. 
um, we'll say, may I give you information about human rights? And the, many people are interested. And so we, we start a conversation in that way. Um, and all of us do serve individuals who speak many different languages. Uh, the Alexandria City Public Schools, the, there are children who speak about 110 different languages. So, you know, we strive to, to do the best we can in, in getting interpretation and translation. But we have learned that we need to talk. We need to talk and listen um, and just be where people are. So to the extent that other community-based organizations can help us with that, contact us, um, we're happy to help. We all do outreach and education a little bit different depending on, on our priorities and the way we do it. In, um, in Prince William County, we're now in a project that we're mapping with GIS where the complaints are coming from in the county, where the responders are located in the county. And the reason is that we want to use that data to target our outreach and education to places where we are not getting complaints for, and then go in there and try, because that, that is a, a signal that, that they don't know about us. So, so, so we're trying to use the new technology, put it that way, to try to drive with data our uh, outreach and education. very much. Let's give a round of applause for our experts. Before we close, and I want to apologize to uh, the representatives from Prince William, Alexandria, and Loudoun first, but I would be remiss if I don't at least give some kudos to my colleagues and staff who are present here from the Office of Human Rights and Equity Program. So we'll Colleagues and staff members of mine, will you please stand to be recognized? Anybody who's here from our office. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules this morning to join us and to glean and learn some information about some of the human rights issues and, and new and emerging laws that are, that are being not only considered, but being implemented and adopted to protect each and every one of our freedoms. So with that being said, we do have, still have lunch and food out in the lobby. Please, please take advantage of that. We don't want to have to take that home with us. So you take some home with you. Thank you all again. Have a great day. <laughs>